Thank you. Thank you very much. Is this microphone okay? It seems very loud. Okay, thank you. I'm very happy to be here with you today, and I'm honored to end this really wonderful forum. Um, I'm just curious, before we get started, how many patients are on warfarin currently? Okay, how many are on the newer anticoagulants? Okay, one, two, okay. And how many are here just as support? Great, excellent. So a lot of these tips that I'll be discussing actually do revolve around warfarin, and many of you have been on these agents um, for several years, so you can potentially share your tips with me as well. I am happy, though, I will try to address some of the newer agents and um, will, am open to answering questions as well. So when patients, when I counsel a patient when they first start a blood thinner, I usually say, try to make them feel a little bit better that these agents, as you know, are extremely common. We can see that over 2 million people take blood thinners every day. However, the caveat is that these agents are amongst the most complicated medications that you could be on. However, they can be very safe and easy to take. So again, I'm going to highlight some challenges, some tips potentially, and I would love to hear your tips as well. So you get that prescription initially. It could be for, as we know, some of the injectable anticoagulants, or I've listed the oral agents there, including the new drugs, dibigatran, rivaroxaban, and apixaban, as well as their brand names. After receiving that prescription, there may be a sense of panic and a lot of questions. So some of the themes that I've heard here this morning are to ask questions. And this is my number one tip, is to ask questions. My husband often gets annoyed with me because I ask a lot of questions. But in this particular case, you have to, and you have to be your own advocate. As one of the patients said, if you can't be your own advocate, have somebody who can do that for you. Um, so I've been educating on the anticoagulants for about eight years. But for the first time, actually, this past January, my mother was diagnosed with a pulmonary embolism. So it sort of became a little bit close to home. Um, she was discharged from a very small rural hospital in New York. There was absolutely no discussion about selection or choice of agent, um, really to the point where I got on the telephone for her with her primary care doctor and tried to have that conversation, pros and cons of warfarin compared to one of the newer agents. Um, and then she actually received no education whatsoever when leaving the hospital, which I was astonished by. Um, but so I sort of did my part, and of course, being my mother, I educated her and gave her the tools um, that she could be her own advocate when dealing with her healthcare providers. So be proactive. Education is key. Try to educate yourself, your loved ones, your family, friends. Um, and I put this quote here that nothing shapes our journey through life so much as the questions we ask. It's vital. There are going to be some challenges, which I know a lot of you have probably already faced with these new agents. Um, and I wanted to prepare you for some of them. And I think there's sort of three areas where, where you will face challenges in terms of taking your medications. One will be initially with your healthcare provider. The second will be in the pharmacy. And then your third will be at home. So questions are going to come to your mind. You get this prescription. You're being told you have to be on a blood thinner. You're thinking, am I going to bleed? What do I do if bleeding occurs? Where should I expect to see bleeding? When should I call my health care provider? And these are all questions that you should ask your health care provider, regardless of who it is, when you are getting that prescription for a new blood thinner medication or a change in blood thinner. In terms of... Um, risks of bleeding. There is serious bleeding, which is when you're going to the bathroom, you notice any blood, vomiting blood. Um, if you fall, that is a risk of having serious bleed. And then there's something called nuisance bleeding, which you may be familiar with. Some tips to avoid bleeding. Serious bleeding would be to be cautious with your high-risk activities. If you're involved with sports, um, mentioned you know when you're driving, carefully driving, trying to just be cautious of any high-risk activities. Um, maybe I've had patients who um, played football, 
um, you know, riding motorcycles, things like that, high-risk activities, you do want to be careful. Wearing proper safety gear, depending what you do for your profession, um, or even if you're just working outside on the house with power tools, um, being cautious again and providing a proper safety gear. When you're inside, wearing shoes or non-skid slippers is potentially a helpful tip to try to avoid falls. And then nuisance, nuisance bleeding is more of minor bleeding. Um, as you know, if you cut yourself, we already talked about shaving, it will take a little bit longer to bleed. Um, wearing protective gloves when you're working with tools. Being careful when you're working with knives, scissors, razors. Um, be careful trimming your hair and nails. Again, if you sort of nip, nick yourself, it may take a little bit longer to stop bleeding. Using a soft toothbrush, your gums may bleed a little bit more. Being careful when you floss. Avoiding toothpicks where you may jab your gum. Wearing shoes outside to avoid cuts on feet. And then, of course, appropriate monitoring. So one of the big things about routine, if you're on warfarin, which majority of you are, um, routine INR monitoring is to ensure that we keep you within that target range, and that will also help avoid bleeding. Another challenge will be this monitoring that you hear about. Again, this only pertains to the warfarin people. Um, you know, what is an INR? Why do I need INR monitoring? How often and what can affect INR? These are all questions that you may have in your mind that, again, should be answered. As many of you know, INR target is individualized, as we've heard. Some patients may have a higher range than others. It will be determined by your healthcare provider. In general, if your INR is below your target range, you are at increased risk of clotting. If your INR is above your target range, you're at an increased risk of bleeding. Each person will require a different dose to achieve the same blood thinning effect. So I think this is important that, you know, one patient may be on one milligram a day and another patient may be on 15 milligrams a day. So whatever dose require, is required to get you to that target range. I know, using my mother as an example, she started at five milligrams, she titrated up to 10 milligrams, which is very common, but she felt like 10 milligrams was very high and her friend was only taking 2.5 milligrams. So trying to make her feel better that it's really very patient specific. In our job as um, healthcare providers and whoever's managing your warfarin therapy is to find the dose that's right for you. Um, and again, testing frequency uh, will be based on the stability of your INR results. Um, if you're stable, it could be once a month. We've heard some patients uh, get their INR test one to two times a week. There is some data that if you are stable, we can extend beyond that once a month testing. Um, and there's also patient self-testing, which can be very convenient as well. Many things, as you know, can change your INR, diet, alcohol, new or any changes in your medications. This includes over-the-counter medications and herbals. Um, any vitamins and supplements, some of those can also affect your INR. And then illness or infection has the potential as well. So another challenge, do I need to change my diet? Um, the way that warfarin works, it's basically inhibiting vitamin K from, from producing those clots, um, those factors in your body that produce clots. So when you eat foods that are high in vitamin K, they do have the ability to decrease your INR because you're giving vitamin K back to the body. Typically, we think of green leafy vegetables, um, Liver, mayonnaise actually has a pretty high level of vitamin K. A lot of oils can. Um, in this resource outside, there's a great list of vitamin K content in foods. And I've also provided a website there for you where you can put in what you're eating and the vitamin K content comes up. The key point here is that tip number four is you have to keep your diet consistent. You do not need to necessarily avoid all of these foods, you don't have to stop eating spinach or your salads, but you have to try to be consistent. Um, we really see changes if you don't eat, let's say, spinach, you never eat it, and then all of a sudden in one week you eat spinach every single day of the week, your INR will drop. Um, but if you keep your diet consistent, our job is again to titrate the warfarin dose to what meets your needs. 
Um, additionally, there is some data that having a small amount of vitamin K in your diet can improve and make your INR levels a little bit more stable. Um, so at times, even for patients who have very fluctuating INRs, and I was thinking about this for you, for you guys, um, there is a little bit of data that says if you give a very, very low dose of vitamin K every day as a supplement, that it can potentially help stable, stabilize your INRs. Alcohol will interfere with your liver's ability to break down warfarin, and it can increase your INR. Um, generally, drinking more than two alcoholic drinks in one day can increase your, your risk of serious bleeding while on warfarin. So if you drink warfarin, again, open communication with whoever is managing your warfarin therapy. Um, do not drink in excess, and try to keep your weekly intake somewhat consistent. Tip number five, how can I help keep my INR in range? We know that all of these different things can affect your INR. The number one thing is open communication with whoever's managing your warfarin therapy. Um, this is not an area to keep secrets or, you know, yeah, I did, I had three drinks the other day, or, you know, just be open. And again, the healthcare provider will make treatment decisions and adjust the dose based on your lifestyle um, and what you need. Also, again, I mentioned prescription medications, over-the-counter medications, herbals, over-the-counter, so cough and cold medicines, um, pain relievers, stomach remedies, all of those types of things. When I say over-the-counter, that's what I mean. Communicate those as well if you begin taking those, or if you were taking them and then stopped them. And then I mentioned patient self-testing or self-management is essentially when you test at home. Um, this may be an option, and if it's of interest to you, you can talk to your provider. Challenge number four is dosing. And again, this is particularly for the new age, um, sorry, for warfarin. The newer agents are a little bit less complicated in that there's pretty much one dose that you take. Um, so for in terms of warfarin, what dose do I take? My dose might change. What does that mean? Um, what time of day should I take my warfarin? I encourage you to keep track of your doses and keep track if you actually took the pill. Um, again, this was something I set up for my mother. I printed out a blank calendar, and I gave it to her, and I said, here, you need to write down your INR after every appointment. Write down exactly what doses you took if you missed a dose. Keep that on the calendar, and then you can have that conversation with the healthcare provider. Um, so, a calendar, keeping notes if, if a book works for you, if you know, there's a program on your computer or your smartphones these days have all sorts of um, apps, which we'll get to in a minute. But keeping track of that dosing, I think, is very important. Challenge number five is picking up the appropriate prescription. And I encourage you to talk to your pharmacist. Um, ask questions when you are picking up your actual prescription. And this includes, to that provider, also communicating your entire medication list. Um, especially if you use different pharmacies, it's important for that pharmacist who's dispensing that medication to know all of the medications you're on, all of the herbals, all of the over-the-counter medications. Some herbals can actually thin your blood as well, so if taking those with a prescription blood thinner, you may be at an increased risk of bleeding. Um, sample medication. So I'm not sure, I think this practice has gone down a little bit, but if you are given samples by your physician and you're taking those, there's no good system to keep those um, in line with your medication profile. The pharmacist will have absolutely no idea you're taking a sample medication. So be sure to communicate that. If there's any change in your medication, so if your provider told you to stop another medication, an antibiotic, um, if you're on a blood pressure medication and they said to temporarily stop it, any type of changes should be communicated at the, to the pharmacist. And then I just wanted to mention cash payment for generics. There are a lot of pharmacies now that do this $4 generic plan, which is wonderful to save money. Um, but again, if, it's not, if you're getting that prescription at a different pharmacy than where you get your other prescriptions, you need to communicate that. And also, if you're paying cash for that $4 generic, there may, it may not, um, if it's not going through your insurance, it won't produce a claim. So sometimes providers don't see that you're taking that other medication. 
Communicate any allergies to your pharmacist before you take that prescription and go home. And then also let them know if you do have any trouble swallowing pills, reading labels, um, remembering to take your medications, opening the, the bottle, um, or paying for medications, because pharmacists do have a lot of tools to help with those as well. So before you leave the pharmacy, ask the pharmacist questions, like you're gonna ask everybody questions. Um, ensure that you know what it's for, what do you do if you miss or forget a dose? Will this take place of anything else I'm using? Especially if you make a switch. I had one patient who came in, she was taking warfarin, and when dabigatran or Pradaxa, the new agent, came out, her provider prescribed that. She didn't realize it was to substitute the warfarin. She was taking both agents, came in with a GI bleed. So be sure that you know, um, particularly if things are changing, what it's for. Where and how should you keep this medication? Some of the new um, Pradaxa, Dabigatran in particular, which right now it's only being used for um, stroke prevention and AFib. But if that medication in particular has to stay in its original bottle. So sometimes there's a little bit of um, strange caveats with, with medications. And then where can you find more information? So these are all questions you can ask the pharmacist. The other thing to do before you leave the pharmacy is to look at your prescription. We're all human, we make errors, and a lot of the times patients are the ones who discover errors before leaving the pharmacy. Be sure that you do have the right medicine. Does the brand, generic name, does that sound correct? Do the pills look very different than your last prescription? Um, in terms of warfarin, regardless of what brand generic you're on, every dose tablet has the same color. So if you know that you take the five milligram tablets that are peach color, regardless of which generic or brand you get, that five milligram tablet should be peach in color. Um, be sure that you know the right dose for the medication. And then a tip that, this tip's actually from my mom. She said to buy a pill splitter, um, especially if you're on warfarin, and I thought that was actually a smart point. So she was never told that. Um, a week after, you know, they were doing the dice dose titration, and she had to start splitting pills. So make sure you have a pill splitter. Challenge number six, then, is when you're at home remembering to take your pill. Um, develop a warfarin routine or a new oral anticoagulant routine. Try to take your pill at the same time every day. Associate it or link it with another activity. Um, there's, you can consider some reminders or triggers. So if you know that you know yourself, you know you're going to forget to take the pill, put a post-it note on the bathroom window, put post-it notes around the house. Um, again, the calendar method I like. Um, having a pill box or a pill organizer can also help. There are some automatic pill dispensers that have a timer that the alarm goes off and you know that you have to take your medication. Um, there are some watches that have alarm reminder systems. Again, for everybody that's using smartphones, there are many apps out there that you can program a time. It alerts you to take your medication. Um, and then there are some services that can actually provide you with a phone call or a voice response system. And then also to reach out to social support. So there's a lot of people here today that are here for support. Look into your family and your friends that can help check in to make sure that you are remembering to take your medications. Additional safety tips, I would recommend if, it sounds like a lot of you are, but to get hooked up with an anticoagulant uh, management clinic or service. These um, highly professional and well-educated providers you know, are the experts. They deal with anticoagulants all day. Um, communicate with those providers. Keep all of your all phone numbers handy. So your physician's phone number, pharmacist, your clinic, um, having all of that information available. Do not stop your blood thinner medication unless directed. This is very important. And also, if any of you have had any procedures, you know it's a little bit complicated when you're on warfarin. You have to stop warfarin, potentially switch to the um, injectable anticoagulants. So communicating any procedures or surgery requiring temporary discontinuation of the blood thinners. And this includes the dentist, um, all other providers that you see. 
Avoid missing a dose, easier said than done, but with blood thinners, you never should double up on taking a dose. So if you forget your medication and you realize, usually we say within six hours, actually, I should caveat, it depends on what you're taking. Um, but if you remember the next day, never ever take two doses at the same time of any of the blood thinners that are out there. Um, in terms of warfarin, pills can only be split once. Recommend to fill out a card, a pill card, or a card of a list of all of your medications. There's, again, I'm going to highlight this guide that is out on the tables. There's a great card in here that you can um, list your medications and also highlight that you are a patient on a blood thinner. Keeping that in your wallet, if, God forbid, something happened, you would have that card that says, I am on a blood thinner medication and let, um, let somebody know. In addition, there's identification um, jewelry or MedID, MedAlert bracelets. And again, in this handout, there is a link to those websites where you can order them. It's a little bracelet that will say blood thinner, or anticoagulant. And again, it alerts people that you are on one of these um, high-risk medications. These are some additional resources. And I think, again, my last message would be the important thing is to not stop questioning. And even Albert Einstein said that. So we should all be asking questions. So at this point, I would love to entertain any questions. Absolutely. Do they have access to the slides? They will. OK. That's the website I referred to with the vitamin K content. Of course, Stop the Clot website, which has great references. And then um, AHRQ has um, a pretty big 30-page handout booklet um, with some basic information about blood thinners. And I believe these slides will be available to you as well. Yes? Microphone. Mm -hmm. I had always been told that with the antiphospholipid syndrome that you had to get the vial, a full vial of blood for a good test results or an accurate test results. Is that true? I mean, am I a candidate to do this at home? Should I want to leave the I lobby of the MGH? Are you aware of antiphospholipid? I mean, it I is... Would say I, I Maybe would I say can. there is some, um, we know from lab to lab, there is known variability because there's different um, preparations of a thromboplasticine. Can I have the mic on at the podium, please? The, with the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, it has to do with the antibodies that they use on the test strips. Yes. So if you have that syndrome, you're not likely or you're less likely to get a, a valid reading using a finger stick. Okay. So okay. for you, yes, for those with APLS, you should stay with venipuncture where you okay. draw from in the arm. But, but I might just follow up with that to say that we know people that have antiphospholipid antibody, because of the variations in different laboratory, the reagents that are used to run these, the INR, the PT-INR test, as well as the instrumentation that's in the laboratory itself, that it is a challenge with uh, to try to find consistent results in and what is the tr you know measuring that true level of anticoagulation. Generally, as Diane was saying, it's generally accepted that a venous laboratory sample is probably more accurate uh, than the finger stick uh, devices uh, for the this, these individuals. Another question right here. I, I take a cumin, and, and generally I take it at dinner somewhere between 6 and 7. If we go out to dinner and I forget to bring my cumin, in, should I take it later at night or just forget about that dose? Okay, that's a great question. So typically you take your warfarin between 6 and 7 at night. If you forget, so I assume if you go out to dinner, you'd be back 8, 9 o'clock. Maybe. Um, I would take it then. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. No, we so would I say would... if you're a patient here in, the, in our <laughs> anti-CoA clinic, take it. 
<laughs> you can take it until I would say one o'clock in the yeah. morning. All right, take it. Don't yeah. forget. I've heard it. a general like six-hour window if it's within, if it's within that window. If you um, you know, the next evening at dinner, you realize, oh, I forgot to take my pill last night when I was out at the restaurant. You would not take two doses. But if it's that night before you go to bed, absolutely take it. Don't double up. Don't double up, exactly. Yes, I don't know if I need a microphone. I'll repeat your question. I'll talk loud. <laughs> okay. Uh, excellent presentation, by Thank the you. way. I just want to know if you could address the. Um, reaction between warfarin and cranberries and grapefruit? It's a very good question. The interaction between warfarin and cranberries is a little bit controversial. At this point, the data pretty much says, unless you were drinking two liters of cranberry juice a day, um, you don't need to worry about it. So small amounts, if you have a glass or two of cranberry juice a day, um, will not significantly impact the INR. If you're drinking large amounts, then you may want to avoid drinking large amounts. That, that's a problem because that is disputed. It, it is. I read packaging and it said to, in bold face, two things to avoid alcohol and cranberry juice. And I said, what? I went online and it said cranberry juice raises your INR and people can have bleed out. So I, I was going to mention that. That was a big shock to me because if you go, if you're a woman and you have a UTI, the nurse will say, oh, have some cranberry juice. But after reading that, that's something that I want to avoid completely is I would avoid alcohol as well. Okay, so I'll just repeat the comment. The comment is that it is controversial. Some packaging and things that you receive will say to avoid cranberries. Um, again, and maybe you can highlight what you, how you educate your patients. But the data that I've seen indicates Again, it has to be very large amounts of cranberry juice. Um, so I, would just I don't know if you're the same. That, okay. Kate, that that's the most recent. For a long time, we, including Kate and I and all of our staff here at the anti Carway Clinic, that's what that was the information we were provided, and that we we dug down a little deeper. I think Dr. Ansel was one of those leading <laughs> investigators there to dig a little deeper, and really we learned that the whole story about the supposed interaction between cranberry juice and the action of warfarin was truly based on a couple published case reports, meaning the experiences of one or two small numbers of people. Not and, and, it, and when it was investigated, there probably were some other things going on with those people that might have explained why the INR crept up. But just, I think the message here is the most recent and the best evidence that we have available to us now is that a glass or two of cranberry juice a day is perfectly fine. Where we're worried is when you're drinking a couple um, gallons, gallons of it. Gallons I mean, a lot. Liters. Okay? <laughs> and the comment, just so that I can maybe make it very clear, about alcohol, we're not saying that you have to avoid alcohol. It's, a, I think... It was explained and it's been mentioned that alcohol can be concerning because it can increase the risk for bleeding. And I would encourage that you have these important but sometimes private conversations with your health care provider and talk specifically for you in your situation, does drinking alcohol pose an increased risk for me? Any other? One more question for Dr. Yeah, Cabral. I have a question. Oh, uh, Katie. Yeah. I have a very good friend of mine, and she refuses. She would love to eat leafy green vegetables, but her blood counts are all over the place. Is it okay for her to try a little? In my opinion, I would say yes. But I think when she tries to initiate in, in consuming some green leafy vegetables, she should be clear with that, you know, have that conversation with whoever is managing her warfarin therapy so that they can be sure to maybe, you know, take an INR test a little bit sooner to see how that's impacting um, her blood levels. Only because you said that it might stabilize her income? There is some data suggesting that a, that a continuous sort of constant low level of vitamin K can help stabilize. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a quick question. 
Uh, how important is it uh, to take uh, your wife here in, uh, uh, let, me, let me put it that way. Is it uh, prior to, to your dinner or after your dinner? So to take your... So, so the question is, do you have to take warfarin with food, or does it, yes. or the, does the time of day matter? Um, and the time of day does not matter. The important thing is that you take it the same time every day. You do not have to take it with food. Um, one of the advantages in taking it in the evening is that typically, you know, you go during the day for your INR draw, you get your results during the day, and then. If you have to change the dose, you still have room that evening to take the new dose um, or the altered dose. So that is one of the advantages of taking it in the evening. Um, but theoretically, if you just cannot remember to take it in the evening, you can only remember to take it in the morning as soon as you get up, I would say that probably outweighs um, the issue of taking it at night because the important thing is to take it at the same time every day. Okay. Well, please join me in thanking Dr. Cabral very, very much today. It was a great, great helpful lecture, I'm sure.